Ah, oh, good afternoon, good evening. Let's see what we have tonight. Ah, oh, some familiar, familiar faces, familiar names. Oh, even Harry's on again, that's a surprise. See if anyone's going to call his dad Boris Johnson tonight. Good. Hello, Mr. Moss. Oh, Harry's put Boris Beaumont. Well done, H. Hi, hi, Adam. Nice to see the chipping's going well. Oh, Alice and Nicholas have joined as well as the UK. She joined twice. I'd say get numbers up, get people to join more than once. So hopefully... <laughs> now, now, this, this is becoming rude now. People calling me vulgar names. Don't like that. So, ah, my good friend, Mr. McNary, how are you, sir? These people here might keep calling me Boris, so I can't work it out. I haven't got blonde hair. I've not had coronavirus, but just rude, rude people. Rude people. So, hopefully, in a moment, we shall have a certain Mr. Kelly. Just a messy. Ah. Here we go. Yeah. Aha! Hey, Boris. How are we? Hi, Boris. <laughs> Is that what you Sorry. <laughs> whoever, I'm telling you, right, whoever started that off, and I know Chuck Cook started that off. I heard it. Hey, Chuck Cook. I mean, he's obviously, his screen was pixelated and things at the time. Or, or he's looking at something else, not the screen I'm talking to. I thought it was funny. Do you know what? I thought Chuck Cook was amazing yesterday. He was awesome. We, somebody said, get him on again and just talk Hogan to him for an hour. No, no. That Hogan story I've never heard before. No, he's awesome. That was absolutely top draw, top draw. Yeah. Uh, but I just thought there were so many little stories that he came up with, you know, Payne Stewart and the pitching and the strategy and everything. And, yeah. and some of the things that he, you know, what he tried to get people to do and things, I just thought, you know, amazing. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. To have that, to have that set up yeah. with physio, biomech, uh, in 1980, it's just, it's just staggering, isn't it? Yeah, I don't even know how the hell the students could afford that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I just, in a way, I was, um, I was blown away because I, I just, some of the things he said like that, you just weren't expecting. No. You know what I mean? I, I was, yeah. I'd, I, you, you read up on things and you look at things so you, you, you kind of prepare for what, what you're going to do but I just was not expecting someone I was not expecting to call me Boris right? <laughs> no, no no I was not expecting you to go on and go even <laughs> Boris I just thought it was maybe, funny maybe I'm going to be the Prime Minister of Instagram next <laughs> <laughs> so then Mr. Kelly the artist eh? <laughs> The artist, you you must have a following of the best golf swings posted on Instagram. Well, I, I only post the good ones. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it, I know it ends up looking like everybody has beautiful golf swings at the academy and everything. But there's, I mean, I guess that's just part of it. There's some I don't post that often and others I do post very often, so... But, I mean, it's, you know, irrelevant to whether you post good, bad, you know. Yeah. There's so much quality in it, you know what I mean? And everybody who I uh, talk to uh, in golf, nobody nobody has a, a bad word to say about you. You know, That's they, good. They, they love they, 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 they love what they see and the, the, the way the swings work and the... Um, you know, just the general rhythm and motions that you create. I just That's think, good. Are, are, are just stunning. But, so where's it come from then? Where's this 
you know, model. Yeah, where does it come from? It, I, I mean, it ends up coming from a lot of places, right? But it, I mean, I'd say from the beginning of it, it basically, it comes from my curiosity. I was, I was an all right player. I was never great. I was always a really bad ball striker, but I was good at scoring. I was good at short game. I was good at not getting penalty strokes. And so when I found out I wasn't good enough to uh, make a good living playing golf, I uh, became a golf instructor. And the first things I started delving into was how the hell, how come I was never a good ball striker? How come I could never hit the balls? Not that I didn't put in the effort. Um, and then you start, you know, you start, when you have nothing, you just start researching whatever. Um, I was lucky. I stumbled upon the golfing machine really early. I feel like I was fortunate at least. It was good for me. Um, had a lot of guys help me out. Uh, what I found out was very early on was that golf instruction is the exact opposite of professional golf. If you know something in prof- as a professional player, you most of the time you keep it to yourself unless you're I guess Brett Rumford or somebody like that. Uh, but most guys keep it to themselves. Like it's their secret and it's competitive advantage. And what I found out in golf instruction is that if you actually reached out to a lot of golf instructors, they were extremely kind and they were extremely uh, helpful um, to get back to you. So I ended up getting early on, got a lot of help from what's his name? Um, uh, Greg McHatton. Which, like, I, I don't know, I, I idolized him. I thought that's one of the most beautiful-looking motions I've ever seen, right? Um, so went down the golfing machine route, learned a lot from that, from a lot of different instructors. Um, Mike Ben and Andy Plummer came to Denmark in, like, 2011, 12. Back then, we didn't have a lot of seminars in Denmark. So um, you just attended whatever. I thought their explanation of cause and effect and how to make a ball flight change was out of this world for me um and how immediate like you could get results by just explaining to the student what was about to happen before it happened and how the ball was going to change its flight um so i learned a lot from them i still do i learn a lot from andy i try to make it for me like an appointment i see him once a year at least just to attend like a training or see him teach or do something i don't know it just it calibrates me I think, I th- and I've met Andy a, f- a few times, and he's a great guy. Yeah, I think he is um, a really knowledgeable, happy to share knowledge, just great guy. And when I think I, so too. When I spent a couple of days here and there, you know, with him, I, I thought that, you know, the the information, his delivery, how he presents it, is is flawless. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah, see, no doubt. I can see a lot of a lot of positives in it, and I see a lot of no, I see a lot of him in your players as well. No, yeah, there's no doubt. Um, I think I think there's no doubt. I think we. I mean, he's my main mentor. He's the guy I learned the most from. He taught me how to um, how to decipher a golf swing, how to see see motions in two D video. Um, also through studying 3D. Um, and I would say then, besides that, it's just been basically like a constant, I don't know, I try to learn from whoever I can. I'm, I don't know, I'm a seminar junkie. I enjoy reading books. I enjoy listening to podcasts. I enjoy watching and listening to these uh, live interviews now that we have some time. And I enjoy, I don't know, trying to like pick bits and pieces I'm like, hey, I think I can add this to my toolbox, or maybe I can't, or maybe I can add this to this one player that's struggling with this or whatever. Um, then I think, yeah, I think that's on top of that. I think that's about it. I always, I don't know, I always thought that there was something beautiful about emotion where it looks effortless, but it's powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think one of the best players who, uh, one of the players that I looked up to when I played, we would get lessons from the same guy as uh, Soren Hansen, um, former Ryder Cup player. Um, oh, he, had, he had a great swing as well. Yeah, and he had this, it looked like he was doing absolutely nothing, and these balls were coming out like missiles, right? Um, it really looked like he was doing nothing. And he was hitting the ball like they were going far. Uh, he would always screw up my swing because I would look at it, it looked like he was hitting a 7 iron, I don't know, 100 meters. 
yeah. You know, when I tried to swing it like so, and I was actually hitting a seven nine hundred meters. <laughs> Well, he, he was, um, was he not, was he a disciple of Mac for a time, Soren Hansen? Yeah, towards the end, he ended up with some sort of, like, he ended up with one of Mac's guys, and he went and saw Mac a couple of times, and uh, different things. He'd always been, um, he was always very, very conscious of his, um, how his face looked at uh, P8 and P9. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, good player. Good player. I think he was top ten in uh, greens from regulation for ten years in a row on the European Tour. So he could, he could hit a ball. Wow, that's impressive stats. Uh, it, was, it was insane. So like looking at him and like how the hell does he do that and how does he make it look effortless and what where's the speed coming from and where's how the hell is he doing it? Um, just became interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, and I think one one thing that strikes me is it's not just what we see in terms of the visual. Um, swinging and the, the aesthetics of something that looked nice. Your players get great results as well. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, yeah. They, they there's, play pretty there's well. A more, there's a lot more substance behind the golf swing than just being a good golf swing. Yeah, yeah I think so too. And I think that's the important part. Like, I, it's rare that I start helping players after they become adults. Most of the players I help, they start out with me when they're between nine and thirteen years old. So it can't be can't be all golf swing. I mean, golf is a lot more than just swinging a club. Um, I think it's just I like to tick that box, and if they're not hitting it good, I know it's not their golf swing. Yeah. Um, and we have, I mean, we have six month indoor season, so have, we have some time to check I, that box off, right? But I, yeah, there's way more than that. Like, I mean, there's strategy, there's uh, your mental state, there's physical, there's skills, there's putting, chipping, there's planning your practices, there's should, there's even diet. There's like there's all these areas where basically, as long as we improve those areas, it should improve them. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think that's what happened in the beginning. Actually, was that a lot of these players had some really beautiful golf swings, and they weren't. Re- they weren't achieving the results that I expected. So why, you had. Why do sorry. you think this? Why do you think that is? Why why should a player who has a what what we would class as a, a good looking golf swing not produce the results that you expected them to produce? Well, it might be that they're actually when they're competing, they're trying to. Um, they're thinking about their golf swing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they might be thinking at where the club is at the top of their backswing or their transition or something really, really precise, which is probably not the most important thing to think about when you want to hit towards the target. Yeah. It probably has to be more vague and abstract. It probably more like a feel or a rhythm or something like that. Um, I think there's something to be said there. I think there's... I mean, there's certain situations, right? There's, I don't know, people have whatever situation they don't like, right? For me, it's always OB down the right, wind coming off the left. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry to say, but on most days, that swing doesn't look like the swing I'm hitting when the wind's coming off my right. Yeah. Um, and it probably shouldn't. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because Drew Skeckle last week touched on the fact of players' swings under pressure on holes they didn't like. There's no doubt being a real issue in tournament yeah. play, especially if it was say 16 and 18, where they needed, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where they, 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 and and how did they actually learn to trust it, yeah. or develop the skill to actually be able to deliver and play that shot when they yeah. were comfortable with it in the eye? I think mean, that's massive, isn't it? Yeah, I think so too. I think there's some strategy involved as well with how you approach. Like you don't I think there's been a lot of stuff. Like I've. I don't know. I think in general, I prefer like a really consistent pre-shot routine, but I don't mind it changing. I remember reading like a long time ago. I remember Hogan for as an example. I don't know if this is true or not, but supposedly his routine wasn't the same on 12 at Augusta. Like he would stand over the ball until he felt the wind that he wanted and then he'd hit. So some, sometimes he'd stand over the ball for a minute on that particular shot. The rest of the round, he would be he would do what he normally did. Amazing. So I think, and I think there's something to be said for that. That doesn't mean that players need to stand there for a full minute, 
but there's a, there's at least there's players when there's let's just say OB on the right, win from the left. Like the more times they look up at the target, the more they start adjusting maybe their setup to the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is basically just moving their path more left, more than likely, right? Which is yeah. probably going to make the ball curve more to the right. And they're doing different things, right? So some of it could be in your preparation. You might be, um, you might do Scott Fawcett's uh, decade system, right? You might map out all the tee shots before you even play. So you just know this is where I'm aiming. I know if I hit a driver here, like I do 95% of the time, it's not going to go over in that trouble. Um, that might be it. It might be that you basically, when you've lined up, you don't look up again. Like, you know exactly what's standing in front of you. If you're scared of it cutting to the right, you might just turn the face in just a hair more before you swing back, just so you know that if it's doing anything, it's going to draw too much. Yeah. But just, you know, like people have in putting strokes, they have different strategies. I don't think there's a single really good putter who puts all putts the same. But it's amazing, isn't it, how our perception, once we stood over the ball can suddenly change or we can start second guessing ourselves that actually I'm aiming in the right place or, you know, as the wind changed direction and thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So much more um, clutter. Yeah. uh, And that's what it's, and then I've experienced that a lot and I don't think that's, I'm sorry to say with young people and the times we're in with social media and all this stuff, I don't think that clutter is going away. I think it's going to be more and more. Well, do you know what? I, and, and I think I think that you pr- you're probably right there because I think in in a in a social media world and in an Instagram world, it is about what it looks like. Yeah, you know what I mean. There is yeah, yeah, there, yeah and the, you yeah, like what the it, amount of thoughts, right? What do people think when I come in from this round? People can Google my scores. They can see my results. They can see my scorecard. They can see oh, what happened on sixteen. Blah blah blah. What does my coach say to me? What does my parents say? What do my teammates or the guys I practice with and play with say? What is everybody going to like? It can be like a complete mind fuck. Sorry, my my language, but it can, right? (laughs) You've got nothing. George Gagas. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. But so that becomes a whole different process, right? It's like, what? so what the hell do we do, right? And you can go down different routes. We for now at least we've decided to go down the mindfulness route the thoughts are thoughts and you decide whatever the hell they mean and they're going to keep coming up and there's nothing you can really do about it and just they're certainly not going to help to tell yourself not to think about them um so there's like that's another aspect where i think it's not just only about improving golf games and results and swings but it's also i mean i think that's lifelong lessons yeah yeah. knowing that thoughts just come up it's part of our i mean that's why the human beings are the king of the hill is because we actually worry yeah yeah and why all the lions and shit are in cages because ah, ah. they don't <laughs> but i think you know when when you when you take away and you look at those you look at those golf swings on yes. on instagram and you they're not just golf swings because there's there's lots of short game shots and lots of short game challenges and lots of skills that players um, demonstrate on there that you can see. And and like you said, six months of the year, they are inside, you know, and they're they're training, just fitting into a net. Like like the whole world is at the minute and we're just locked up. And I I think there's mileage in that to a large degree because I think that, you know, um, it, it, it allows players to not worry about the result. And can yeah, I think so too. To the process of of swinging, you know. What I mean? Yeah, I, Which I, I think, think is, we can get most of done. I think it's time and the problem. You know what I mean? I, I think there's a that that has a place in golf, and probably you know certainly where where I see players is how many times would they practice work on something that has no result, so they can commit to the the process of improving, as opposed to trying to yeah control the result at the end of the day and I, I you know yeah. from a personal I think it'd be really interesting to see how much players get better in this period of time where where they can't they can't hit shots or see the, see the ball yeah and it's well I mean that's the thing right like I've got a crew of I don't know almost 60 players who've been waiting for six months for, to get outside 
and, yeah. <laughs> and now they don't know when they're playing um and they don't know when the thing they, they've been prepared and we were about ready to tie it up and know like okay everybody knows what they're doing outside we've got all the hard work's done uh, let's go play and let's just maintain whatever we worked on and then it's like oh more maintenance more work more yeah. practicing in the nets but it's um i mean it's it's equal for everybody and we can't do anything about it but Yes, I think it does have, in some certain cases, it has an advantage. I think six months is too long, if I'm being honest. Like, it's a freaking long time. Yeah. I think it's like three months, maybe four, I think would be good for a lot of players, uh, especially young players. Um, six months is too long, but yeah. it's what we got. But, I mean, you've got six months. to You can actually, in six months, impart the right change on that player, ready for the new season. Nah, it's not. I'm not going to say that like a completely. I don't know, like a new beginner or a player who's played for two years who shows up with like it's played with two heavy clubs when they were long, when they were young and they have their <coughs> strange movement patterns and they um, maybe they aren't very coordinated. Like six months, they're not going to look like Tommy Fleetwood when they come out. Um, what, what I mean is, you, 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 you at least can have a plan and a time scale. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt. And we can take some big pieces and we can get some big stuff done. If they want to put in the hours, we can get some. We can get a lot of work done. And I think that's again, that's again. I'm, I'm lucky. Like I'm fortunate. It's not like I can just take whatever random kid off the street and give him a beautiful golf swing. Like these kids are really, really committed. A lot of them. We've had some that spend up to 30 hours a week in that indoor facility all winter every week right like they bust their butts this is what they want to do they're practicing all the time all the movements they're recording they come over they ask like how's this like what about this what about this what about this like they're busting their butts that's why the change is happening so i mean you you have a great program over there great program you know so how does how does that weekly schedule um what what is that weekly schedule for a young kid who comes into the? Uh... Uh, it depends. So it depends on their um, depends actually on how many hours they spend, and a little bit about on their age. Um, if they don't spend, um, let's just say they think golf's fun and they want to do it during the winter as well, and their club doesn't have a winter program, it might be about five, five hours a week. It's every Friday and then every other Saturday and Sunday they come into practice. Then as they get, if they spend more than if they are before high school, but they spend, let's say they spend at least 15 hours a week practicing their game, also doing winter time, they get offered a different group to practice with. Um, Cause that's when we can get like, they think it's fun, but in a different way. Um, they think it's fun because they like improving. It's not just because they're hanging out with their friends. Um, they get a minimum of uh, seven hours a week of practice. And then they have like some 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 extra practices. Then we have a high school program which practices a lot, but they practice in like the mid hours of the day. So they probably have a total with physical training and stuff. They probably have a total of twelve hours of practice a week where I'm there. And then there's um, the I guess the most skilled group, which are like the professionals and um, and high level amateurs who aren't in high school anymore who are like full-time amateur golfers, and they have uh, their own six hours a week, two mornings a week. So that's like the general rule. Oh, okay. And, and if you take um, that that 12 hours then, yeah. that 12 hours at the indoor facility, working with just yourself, or is there multiple coaches in there? No, it'll be with most of them. It'll just be me. And then when we have the bigger groups, so that would be Tuesday and Friday evenings, I have some guys to come in and help me. Um, I have one of the other coaches in the academy. He does a lot of short game stuff. So he does the wedging stuff. We used to have a putting guy, but he quit. So now I'm doing the putting too. Um, and then we have a physical trainer who comes in as well and helps. With that. Okay, so, so that's a pretty serious program then. For yeah, it's all right. It's it's uh, it's all right. It's not it's not like we've got like some PGA tour dude who's just, like doing the physical training. Like it's really really basic stuff. It's basically from chest from chest down to above the knees, front and back, and like only body weight and stuff. And it's not it's nothing advanced. It's not a um, it's not an individual program. It's not like anything like that because um, we can't we can't afford that. Okay, and and when they're there, how many, how many would you have in a group? 
um, they would probably be about between 15 and to 20 players coming in for three hours. That's a lot of players for three hours. Yeah. How do you get so? How do you structure what they do within that time? Do you, do you set them the different skills or? No, but that's the thing, right? So when they come in, they come in Tuesdays and Saturdays. That let's just say this one particular group. So these are kids between the age of twelve and probably sixteen um, that are highly dedicated. They'll usually they'll have like uh, six of them will come over to me for long game. It's usually just technical feedback. We already put down the plan. We already know what to do. It's basically a lot of checkups, um, different ways of practicing that one skill so that we can basically put on top of all of them and say, hey, everybody, this this is how we're doing it today. It might be in really, really slow versions. It might be in uh, mirrors. It might be whatever. But they have their own individual assignments that we agreed upon. Like this is the area of your golf swing we're focusing on. Um, some of them will be a short game thing. It's usually skill development. So it used to be like leaning areas or hit over something or like a point system or something where they're competing. And then they'll have um, probably six of them will have physical training and then we'll just rotate once an hour. So uh, that's basically, so Tuesdays, I decide what we're doing. Like that's me and they come in and they are being told what to do. Then they'll come back on Saturdays where we practice from 8 to 12 in the mornings and we basically flip it around. So they decide what to do. I'm there to help, but from eight to 11, they have to plan out their practice. So that's like a, it's like a practice in how to, it's training. How do I, how the hell do I schedule my, my things? Um, Which is massive as well. Yeah. They're spending a lot of time alone. Well, I think golfers spend most of their time alone. Yeah. You know, even at the, at the highest level to a degree. Yeah. That, you know, that ability to self organize and plan, and set yourself some sort of goals to what you need to achieve. Yeah. I think it's a great skill for long-term development. I think so too. And I think it's rare that I think golf is rare in that way. Cause I think most other sports you show up and a coach have planned something out and you're going to do whatever the coach told you to. And you're not going to, you're not going to think about what am I like, what am I actually doing today? What do I need to do? And what do I feel like doing? I think most players, if they haven't scheduled what they're going to do, they're probably going to go to the club and they're just going to do what everybody else are doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which yeah. again is perfectly fine. Um, if you just like golf, it's probably not great. If you have some sort of goal to get a college scholarship in America and afterwards turn pro and then make, become a millionaire, you probably need some more quality in the time you're spending and you probably need to get used to being on your own quite a bit. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the, these kids who are coming to you and they're spending that amount of time, they've yeah. got to be committed, committed to the pro, to, to the process. Yeah, there's no doubt. And what what do you do then if the kid isn't committed, or do we not? Is that not really an option? Well, you know, then they're probably gets, not. Then they are hopefully they are not in the group with all the other kids that are committed, because it kind of screws up the environment. Yeah, yeah. So what I've found, and I'm not going to say that this is like this goes for all cultures and all countries and stuff, but what I've found at our academy is that the skill level and the age and the age of the player is not nearly as important as the mindset. So like a 20 year old dude who's the Danish match play champion can have tremendous amount of respect and actually like practicing next to uh, five 13 year olds when they're doing technique. Yeah. Because he likes being in that environment right then and there, because when he wants to practice his golf swing, he wants to do it in the company of other players who are not taking a break every five minutes, looking at their cell phones. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't care. He doesn't really care if they're good or bad because all he sees is their dedication um whereas like it's a kid named frederick and he says it the same way he says like i'm not going to go with these kids if i want to compete if we're doing a competition i wouldn't join in on what they're doing like i'll only join in on the technical thing because that's again that's another part of our academy is like the they're they're basically in levels the different groups but you can always move down a level and join a practice at a lower level if you want and i think some good stuff happens there when uh challenge to a professional or a uh, national team player of some sorts all of a sudden they're standing amongst a boatload of 11 12 year olds like they're i'm not going to say they're idols right there in front of them but it's almost like okay 
that's how good you can be at golf. Right? They see it right there. They're not just being told. And I think he gets, I think that's very motivating as well for a young kid. There's you no know, doubt. You know what I mean? And I think uh, certainly if you took, um, a friend of mine is a, is um, an Olympic martial arts coach and, and, and he will have a lot of the time older ones training with younger ones. Yeah. Just because of the time. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the, the younger ones, not just do the technique, but they start to see how the more experienced player or the, the, the better athlete trains their attitude towards it. And I think in, in golf, um, it's, it's the ability to see what, what they actually hit it like. How do they hit it? What does it sound like? How does the ball fly? Yeah. You know? yeah. Where, you know, if you've never seen that or never witnessed it from a high level player, you, to some degree, you have no comparison as no. to what you're trying to ultimately achieve. You know, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Like, there's no doubt. And I think that becomes the thing, too, is that all of a sudden, like, because the kids that are academy, they come from multiple clubs. They come from all over the uh, east coast of Denmark. Some of them drive for two hours to get to practice, right? Like, they, they yeah. come pretty, pretty, from pretty far away. But a lot of them come because they're probably the best player at their club. And some of them are, maybe they found out in competition that, holy crap, there's a lot of guys that are way better than me. And they find out that, okay, I thought I was pretty good at these different things, but that's because I didn't know what good was. Yeah. Because all of a sudden I see, like, like you, you'll talk to a player, right? Like, so how's, it go? how's your putting? Oh, I putted well. I only had three, three putts last round. It's like, three... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you know what it means to putt well, buddy. <laughs> hey, that like, point, Jack, you got sacked. <laughs> you know, I, I was just saying, right? Like they don't know until they see it and until somebody tells them and all these things. And I think it's important that somebody needs to tell them because how else are they supposed to know? Yeah, they yeah, think yeah. they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're practicing more than everybody else at their club. So that's got to be plenty, right? Yeah, yeah. And the thing, the thing is, Andrea, is the environment that you produce. I mean, if you if you go back to the books like the Talent Code and Bounce, etc., then mm -hmm. they all talk about the, the 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 environment being the one of the key pieces to actually the the skill development in players. Yeah, the environment the environment isn't necessarily just the building; it's the environment that you create. You know, and the the culture that you create, and the respect that you've got from these kids based off what you actually do. Yeah. I mean, and I think the, the, the key piece in, in the environment is the person in the middle of it who is actually orchestrating it. Because, you know, the more the players buy in to, to you and the, more, the, the harder they want to work. Because yeah. they know where you can take them if they work hard enough. Yeah, I think I think I think some of that's is that correct? There's a lot to do with talent too. Like and there's a lot to do with um cuz I think cuz I really I enjoyed the hell out of the talent code and I think it's a really good book. And I saw Bounce, I read that and read Talent is Overrated and Outliers and all these things. Like I was infatuated with it, right? And 10,000 hours and that's is out sorry. Outliers is the is the latest word to come out and book. Yeah, right? <laughs> but the, so I read this, right? And I was just like, oh my God, this is like exactly like, oh my, it's just 10,000 hours and there you go. Like, and just be like, just be committed, right? And deliberate practice and all these things. And then uh, Epstein writes this book called The Sports Gene, which basically says the exact opposite, right? Where <laughs> high level performers are basically made at birth, right? Like you can eliminate 99.99999% of the world population from winning a hundred meter sprint of winning the Olympic medal at a 100-meter sprint at birth because some are just born to do it and most people aren't. And then I think there's, and to be honest, like the, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle of these two things, right? Well, I, I think is if the, if the size of the athlete matters enough. Yeah, and I was about to say golf is different. So golf is complicated, right? And you can have one year Luke Donald's number one in the world and then one year... 
Dustin Johnson's number one in the world, right? And they don't play the same way. Uh, so you can there's more up there's more ways to be good at golf. Um, and I think that's the really cool part. So I think it's more about the deliberate practice. I think those books are really good starting point. At least they work for me. It's something I'm conscious of. At least I think I think you know when when you when you look at a player, yeah, you know, as a as a you don't just look at a player's golf swing. You look at the entirety of the player, their game, their mindset, and everything else. You know and I would imagine that there are some players who come who maybe don't exhibit certain skills early on, but with determination and sort of mental strength and skill in other areas, they, they sort of carry on driving, driving through. And then the moment they do start to develop skills in other areas, then they just, they just flourish. Oh, there's no doubt. I'd say, I would say this. I would say that there has been a lot of boys and girls that have surprised me both ways. We've had kids come in at age nine, been the best nine-year-old in, in Europe. And two years afterwards, they're not even the best 11-year-old at our indoor facility. Um for whatever reasons and we've had it the other way around too where some kids have shown up and you can't like it's just i think it's human nature to just kind of look at them and go like huh i think this guy could be pretty good right and you look at somebody else and go like he like he's like you try to move his right hand grip and you just like all of a sudden his left knee started moving all of a sudden as well and you're like well, hang on <laughs> how the hell do these two things connect like because they're so co uncoordinated and they'll surprise the hell out of you too sometimes um, where you're like two years afterwards, you're like, oh my God, like how we've come a long way. Um, and I think that's the, the whole, like the whole thing is, and I think I forgot which one of all these books, they probably all speak about it called like ignition. Um, yeah. like when is the player turned on to something where they go like, this is what I want to do and I want to get really good. I think when that happens is when they become. They, they, they're really, really recipient towards guidance. And they're, all of a sudden, they're like just like a dog wagging their tail. And they're like, tell me what to do. I'll do it. Yeah. And that's when you need to have your shit in order so you're not telling them stuff that's wrong. Yeah. Um, but until then, I could practice with a kid for probably a hundred. I don't know. I could, see, I could probably teach him 20 hours a week, every week for three years straight. And he wouldn't get much better. If he didn't like it, yeah. And if we if we look now at, at this this gallery of swings, yes. Right? And that uh, I, I can't remember some of the names. Uh, there's there's a couple of girls who, who swing it really great, as well as some some lads who just seem to have the the stamp on them that just smells yeah. as Cali all over, right? Even oh. if even if they weren't on your Instagram. I yeah. probably know where they've come from, right? But yep. what, what you know, I think sometimes we don't realise is at some point they weren't that athlete, were they? At some no. point they turned up as a as a young, impressionable kid. Yeah. You know, who's, and how, how long have some of them been with you to have gone from that first... first um, well, I've been in the junior academy. This is my seventh year. So some of them have been with me for seven years. Um, so some of them, like, which the really cool ones, there's like a kid named Sebastian, right? Like he came in at age 10, I think. He's 17 now. Wasn't, he was quiet. You could tell he was all right, but he wasn't great. You didn't really pay attention. Like the only thing you'd pay attention to is every time you told him something at practice, the week after, you did not tell him much. But every time you told him something at practice, the next week you could see it changed. Either he'd overdone it or he wasn't quite there yet, but it didn't look the same. And I think at age 14, he shoots 63 on a par 72 in a men's tournament and wins. And the year afterwards, he wins the European Young Masters. And all of a sudden, he's getting letters from UCLA and Illinois and all these places. And you're like, this little shit, right? <laughs> he was just this little... <laughs> 
he didn't really pay attention to him because even that like his age group in the junior academy, he might have been when he started, he was the fifth best kid just in our little building. And he got turned tremendous. And I think that's pretty cool. Sometimes like a time hop shows up and I see like a 10 year old Sebastian swing in the club. And he, now he's like a head taller than me. And back then he was up around my belly button. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting isn't it? because that kid who comes at 10 years old, yeah. who, who isn't necessarily the, the best or finds things the easiest. No. And at 14, it's just, on fire yeah. yeah i just think is you, you see all the time don't you you know you you I, you know i remember groups i thought where you, you'd have a kid in the and they'd just be a little bit quiet they wouldn't necessarily you know the best but they were there every week yeah every time training they were there yeah you know? and and there were times where actually they weren't they were never winning the competition no they were never the best one in the week but but their effort was always there yeah you know I mean? you, yeah you, there's something about that sort of kid where you're going, you just just be patient with him and let him develop. Because yeah. you know, it's starting you can see it starting to starting to appear. I think that's cool as hell with him, right? Is that he's ever since I met him, he never wanted advantages. Even if he was competing something they were playing a difficult golf course and I didn't want to give them strokes or something like that, and I told him like you've got to move up two tees because this guy's a professional golfer and you're freaking 13 year old and he's like no i was looking like why it's like i'm playing from back where they're playing because you're gonna get murdered i don't care i go you know, just like what say come on dude like you're gonna get murdered i don't want to shoot your confidence down like this course is too long <laughs> it's too difficult right and he'll come over like he'll bring me over he goes like if i beat them like i don't want for them to say that i because i played in front of them like i played tees up front i go okay that's cool and he's always been that way, right? So he's always been like, whenever he's attained something, then he's the best junior in the country. Then he's like, all right, onwards and upwards. Then he wants to compete against the men. And then he wants to keep compete against the pros. And then he wants to, it's just never been like no satisfaction whatsoever with where he's at. And I think that's a pretty good mindset to have if you want to get really good at golf. I, I, think, it's, I think it's a great, great, I think it's a great mindset to have in, in any sport. Yeah. In any sport. And I think, I think I think it's sometimes the the guidance that you've given him that enables him to sort of ignite and go. You know, yeah, like, I, 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 I don't know. I, at least I didn't scare him away. I know that much. <laughs> well, you, I, I look at it in other sports. You look at it. You know, I, I, I see it all the time in football where a player would come into a football club and and they look all right, but they didn't necessarily look like a world beater. No. And then they move to another club, and all of a sudden they're the best in Europe. And you're yeah. like, he was here yeah. two seasons ago doing yeah. nothing and the, uh, the he, he looked ordinary. He, yeah. You would never have... And then you look two years later and you're like, he's going to be the best player in Europe. He, yeah. he's, he's now worth millions and millions of pounds and you're like, is he the same person? You know yeah. what I mean? yeah. and, and that's not, you know... He was the same person maybe a couple of years ago that he is now. Cause yeah. He's a, He's a bit older. Right? Yeah. But somebody ignites the fire. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, something least, something and I, X and clicks. I would be a multimillionaire if I knew exactly how to do that. If I could just tell, like, this is the recipe for getting kids to love golf more than anything else in life. I would be a freaking, I'd just walk around and sell it. <laughs> I don't. I know. I know what doesn't work. And I know that pushing them and telling them what to do and make demands and all this stuff is not working. So it's got to be like, it's usually like being in an environment, seeing somebody else succeed. It's like having older brothers, like older siblings succeed definitely works. It's having it like making it fun, making it challenging, but in a good way. <sighs> always praising effort, not results. Always like pra praising the hard work, uh, the intensity all these things when it's deserved, but also like being honest, I think those things are definitely like moving things in the right direction. I'm not going to say that I'm batting a hundred cause I'm not, I'm not like <laughs> there's some where I'm like, dude, I'm freaking like in my heart of hearts. I wish that this guy would just put some time in and just love it as much as the people around him loves it. Cause he would be amazing. And maybe it's just, he just does it because he's good at it and people, 
praise him for it because he's good. And that's got to be like a nightmare, really. Well, I think, you know, sometimes the the kid who finds things really easy to start with and they think the game's easy, so yeah. you have to try, you know, and yep. it just comes naturally to them. So every time you have a competition, they win it, you know. There's a time for them, isn't there, where it gets hard. Or yeah, get to, it does. You get to a level where you're now going, I can't win now. No, I see that too. Uh, you know, I, I think I heard, I heard a lady say it once where I thought it was like a really good analogy. Like, imagine being the like a savant at playing the flute, and everybody starts tearing up every time you play the flute, and it's the most beautiful thing people have ever heard in their entire lives. Now, also imagine that you absolutely, more than anything in the world, fucking hate playing the flute, and you're that guy. It's got to suck. It's got to suck that you're like the freaking best the world has ever seen and you hate it. And that happens to, I think that happens to actually quite a few, especially female golfers. And, that, and you know, the thing is that that's hard as well, isn't it? To suddenly, to suddenly hit a wall or, or, or end up with this adversity that you can't do it. 